Now, software as a service, a good example of this would be Google Drive, actually, what I'm using to do this presentation for you. I just, I just log into my web browser and access it. Everything's there. I really don't have to worry about anything. Google takes care of it all for me. I'm just there to give it my input, to get the value out of the software. Oh, here we go. I put in a slide where I go through some of these examples. So it's a bit dated because docs and spreadsheets, beta doesn't exist. You'll have to forgive me. Salesforce.com, NetSuite, IBM Lotus Live, all good examples. Platform as a service, we have Google App Engine, which uh, at the time, they've renamed this to, uh, to be a container platform. And infrastructure as a service, we see Amazon, AWS, VMware. Now, this is actually, this is a bad slide, I apologize, because it kind of lumps everything and oversimplifies things, because AWS has elements of all three of these uh, categories. So at this point, we could look at, um, we could look at how AWS kind of came to be. Um, AWS being the first one to get to the market, they, they control about, I'd say 60 to 70% of the market share. Their only main competitor right now that's eating up market share is uh, Azure, uh, which isn't surprising because Microsoft uh, you know, is everywhere and their, their cloud is you know, directly integrated with their software offering. Now, at first, AWS came out with this idea that, hey, you know what, we have a lot of extra capacity. They notice like they buy all these servers around Christmas time and they don't use 80% of the capacity come two months later. So the, the bright engineers at AWS said, at Amazon, sorry, said, hey, you know what, we should figure out a way to provision some of our in, you know, private resources outbound. Let's take the internal IT practices that we've developed and start monetizing it and profiting off it. Uh, and they could do it, they're at scale. They're, they're an international company. So at first the offerings are very limited. We only had EC2, EBS, and S3. And uh, EC2, if you're not familiar with it, is their virtual machine platform. And just, just uh, an interesting tidbit, when they first came out, you couldn't actually restart an EC2 instance. So you turn it on, put your application, whatever you want on it. If it turns off, it's gone. So it's now it's, they, they put the onus on you as the administrator, as the user, to kind of go through and uh, make sure you can protect your data. Now, we've come a long way since then. You could restart EC2 instances. And Amazon has over 800 uh, offerings at this point. Here's just some of the some of the applications AWS has, uh, and you'll forgive me that you can't really can't really read this, but from the from the management console, which you can just access from the web, you can go in right away. And by the way, I don't know if you if you haven't signed up for AWS, you can sign up for it. There's a free tier, like you don't have to pay ever, if as long as you're using a certain amount, of, if if you're consuming a certain amount of resources, which is usually ideal for someone in, like in, in school. When you're just learning, you want to develop a little bit and get your hands dirty. You don't have to pay out of pocket, which is phenomenal. I myself use it quite a bit. Uh, I still use the free tier. I've used it for years. And uh, even to this day, since I do experiment quite a bit with some of the other technologies, I have about a monthly bill of like $10. So it's very, it's very small for a uh, small price to pay for the amount of technology I have access to. But I mean, these are just some of the services. Um, and I, <laughs> I'd love to go through all of them, but I just, we don't have enough time. But I encourage you to go on and online and check out uh, Check out their services, and Amazon does a great job of like teaching you a lot about them. Um, I just threw in this this uh, slide in here just to kind of talk about some of these companies, which really wouldn't exist without the services that AWS provided. I mean, Netflix, Reddit, Imager, Reddit, Imager, SoundCloud, and Dropbox, especially, were founded on AWS. They're they're cloud native websites that started, and if it wasn't for Amazon. I mean, think of Reddit, Reddit and Imager alone. They wouldn't be able to scale. Dropbox was one of the first object store providers that took Amazon's S3 service and a lot, made it a lot easier for folks just to upload and share photos without having to muck, muck around with APIs and doing things in a programmatic way. And we're getting to the point where more and more businesses and companies are using it. And I mean, it's not fair to just talk about AWS. I love AWS, but there are other, there are other competition. There are other competitors, and competition is very healthy in this space because they, it forces everybody to innovate. And when everyone innovates, we win. So we have other ones like Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, like I said. Google Cloud actually controls, a, I think it's very small. It's like less than 10%. Microsoft Azure is growing rapidly. I mean, they went from like 12%, I think a year or two ago, to almost 30% today. And you can see that in newer versions of Microsoft Windows, uh, 2012 R2 and 2016, Azure's built in there. I mean, even if you use Windows 10, you log in, you see like the little OneDrive thing popping up there. Microsoft wants you to start using their cloud. Um, it's already there, it's native. To get other stuff, you have to go to their websites and download. If you want to get, you know, if you want to use your Google Drive, you have to go and download their app. 
Now, th this is just a small slide I threw in here just to kind of demonstrate the differences in pricing between these instance types. Um, you could see, I mean, this isn't really relevant until you get to the point where you're consuming so many resources that it's, uh, it's becoming very difficult. And then you're looking at re-architecting your actual application. But at this point, uh, you could see that when it comes down to it, AWS uh, still is the cheapest uh, when it comes to certain tiers. Um, but again, this is, this is looking at what they list. There's, there's spot instances. There's, um, you can have a reserved instance where you pay every month if you know you're going to be using it. So you, there's, there's ways. Amazon, in fact, actually has engineers will just work with you to reduce your AWS bill. Um, so the, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, <laughs> complexity even to the billing aspect of this. So this slide, I want to kind of talk about the previous way of building an application, right? So let's say before you were an app developer, you worked for a company, the company said, hey, we have to develop this application. Um, you know, you have to go, you have to go to the guy. Either you manage the system yourself, which you probably hate because you don't like managing systems, you're a programmer. So you go and you got to like install Windows, you got to do all these updates, you got to install your database, you got to take backups. And then you do all this development and then at the top you get your result, you get your business value. This process is slow, it's cumbersome, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult to manage and really it kind of, it only, it makes it only easy for those who have the infrastructure to begin with. What we have today with the cloud is anybody, anybody can start that amazing business. Anybody can start that amazing technology that they want to build. They just need to focus on uh, the development and they can consume everything else from the cloud as a, as a service. Everything is as a service. You can, conserve, you can consume database as a service. You can do Hadoop. You can do big data as a service. You can set up a messaging queue. You don't have to worry about installing Rabbit. You don't have to install, worry about Linux dependencies. Go ahead, right away, start consuming it. Orchestration, monitoring. And at the bottom, I mean, this hasn't gone anywhere. This is, this is still there, but your cloud provider is, is doing it all for you. So what you have here is you have an evolution of scale. You have the capability now to rapidly prototype an idea that you have. And that, in my opinion, is really cool. The fact that you, everyone now is empowered. They have the power of the world's greatest data centers and the smartest minds that are backing them. And once things take off, at that point you can look back and maybe grow your development team, but anybody at this point can go ahead and start consuming things. You don't have to muck around with all of those technologies I was just describing. At, a, at some point during the offering, you, you look at a basic offering which IT is pretty much still stuck into this, to this day. Like I said, a lot of, a lot of businesses still don't really grasp the concept of cloud. They still look at things from a physical server kind of idea. Uh, eventually, as we kind of continue to move up this, this spectrum to the point where we can, we can have, you know, we basically we start with VMware and then maybe we move towards our own private cloud, uh, which could, could be proprietary. At some point, we want to actually have something on-prem, uh, which allows us to save money and to, uh, to have the same capabilities as we would in the, in the public cloud. Yeah, actually, I just went, I just went through this, um, th these points with you guys. You can, you can rapidly prototype any application. So um, after, you know, after the software is taken off, if you build that you know, amazing web app and you're noticing, this is what it always ends up looking like. I don't know if there's a marker up here. But uh, you kind of start small, right? Maybe you get a few users and all of a sudden something happens. Your software takes off. People, maybe someone wrote a blog about it or who knows, you're mentioning the news. All of a sudden you're getting all these users, but now from here, you're like, oh my God, my cost is just, it just quadrupled overnight, you're panicking. At that point, you can do a few things. You could look at developing more of a hybrid strategy where you move some of those things on-prem, or uh, you can actually go in and you know, change the way your application works, consume other services, maybe consume other services a bit less, put up more load balancers, et cetera. Stratascale, the firm I work for, we obviously sell, we, we maintain and we sell, um, that, that sort of infrastructure for you to have a, a hybrid cloud, uh, kind of, in, yeah, hybrid cloud for yourself. A lot, of, a lot of people do that. I mean, they'll, they'll come to us and say, hey, listen, my app took off. My developers were rapidly prototyping our application. They, we didn't have time to go back and optimize our code. And now our AWS expenses like, have quadrupled in the last three months. So we say, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll move that onto Stratascale. We'll move that onto our platform for now. And then we'll figure out a way to kind of, you know, make your developers consume less and less and less. I mean, that's kind of an unfortunate side effect of this, <laughs> of all the frameworks and everything that are out there. We have developers who write very sloppy code that consume way too much memory, consume way too many uh, CPU cycles, maybe too much disk space. And they don't care. They're like, hey, it works. Let's keep going, you know? 
betas, uh, customers end up being your beta, beta testers uh, in today's day and age. Um, but uh, again, it, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to go back and optimize it once you get to scale. Because you know, poor code is not going to do very well. There's now the old way of scaling would be vertical scaling. So OK, you have your web server. You're getting bombarded with traffic requests. It's very easy to go, hey, let's just get a faster server. Let's just buy, let's call up Dell, go buy some more CPUs. Let's get some more RAM in this, in this thing. Um, that, that works. It's not a good practice to fall into uh, because really you're not considering the actual core of the problem, which is you need to start considering a horizontal scale. So stop, stop building a monolithic application that works like a black box. Consider separating everything into a microservices kind of model where services communicate with each other using a messaging queue. What this allows you to do now is you can consider a horizontal scaling method. So instead of uh, saying, OK, we're getting more resources, we need to go buy more RAM or shut the VM down, add more RAM, turn it back on. Instead of doing that, you can say, OK, it's fine. We'll just spawn more web servers. Add those IP addresses to our load balancer and go. And you know, at the end of the day, the load balancer is going to be taken care of um, it will be utilizing those extra resources that you spawn for it. And also allows you to kind of decouple your application into separate services that you can then manage or you can have teams manage. So it's a lot more effective methodology to uh, scaling your app. And here's an example of that, actually. I just put a little diagram up here. So here we have, and this is, I think, using Amazon's uh, Elastic Load Balancer service. So we have Route 53 here, which is their DNS service. And this can be mywebsite.com. Requests are coming into ELB. You can set up web services across both availability zones. Amazon, um, the way Amazon works is it's split into all these regions. Each region always has two availability zones. Now, the way Amazon will, will do their maintenance is they won't migrate your virtual machines or your data for you. They're, they're too big. And I mean, if you're a customer of Amazon, unless you're like, unless you're, unless you're Steve Jobs or well, reincarnated himself, they're probably not going to listen to you and, and make any exceptions, but they'll do maintenance on one availability zone at a time. They'll never bring down a whole region. That's ridiculous. But the onus is on you now as the administrator, as the cloud administrator to ensure that you have a, an ELB, an elastic load balancer set up, providing uptime between both availability zones. And like I said, you can configure application metrics like disk response time. Say, okay, you know, a visitor, a, a user is coming to my site. It's too slow. Uh, if, we hit a, if we hit a threshold of over 150 milliseconds, spawn another instance, spawn another instance, keep spawning instances until that threshold comes down. And uh, that's, that's basically how ELB works. And you can, you can configure other application metrics like disk latency, CPU, um, CPU uh, ready time, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, we'll kind of jump into the emerging trends, um, which, is, which is actually very interesting. And I'm, I myself am curious to see where this is going to go. Um, one of those is AI as a service. Uh, I mean, we're seeing it now more and more and more. Um, these are, are benevolent cloud providers as they may, uh, like Facebook and, and Google. Are, they obviously monitor our, our communication, right? What we're doing is actually kind of feeding their, we're training their AI. And all these AI engineers are working together because this is considered the next revolution uh, in my opinion, revolution in computer science, and I think in humanity in general, where, where we can have computers start replacing human beings when it comes to doing these mundane tasks. And that way we can focus on innovating, con continually creating. Now, I'm not going to get into each one of these, um, but Amazon allows you to go ahead and start consuming some of their own services that they have. Uh, Spark is a very interesting one. Uh, allows you to allows you to process massive data sets along with EMR. Uh, Amazon Machine Learning is an also is, is a very interesting uh, is a very interesting product as well, where you could feed it your own data, and you can actually set up predictive patterns that uh, could reduce, say, you know, you could you could analyze your users' traffic, the chats, say they're having with your customer support techs, and you can actually have a robot have a robotic tech that is um, trained in order to help them out. And of course, there's other AI engines. These are like Apache, MXNet, TensorFlow. Torch, the Anno, these are all free, open source. There's, there's quite a bit of uh, buzz and research in this, in this field. Another, another trend I'm seeing a lot more of is people using VDI. Um, and VDI just stands for uh, Virtual Desktop Infrastructure. So this whole time I've been talking about servers, uh, application servers. Um,
but we ignore the fact that people still consume consume the consume all these services through a computer. For a lot of people, this is uh, this is difficult for them to to manage on scale. Let's say you have ten, tens of thousands of employees. There's a lot of computers you got to buy and maintain. It's a lot easier to consider buying like a thin client and allowing them to connect to your VDI infrastructure. VMware and Citrix have been doing this for years already. VMware has VMware View. Citrix has Zen Desktop. There's also application virtualization as well, where they just deliver the application to you remotely. Amazon Workspaces is an infrastructure where you can just consume a desktop literally just as a service. So you, you can literally go to a website, log in. You could, you could set this up right now for yourself if you're curious. You could literally just log in and set up a little Windows VM that you can log in and out of. You can connect through RDP. You can connect through their website. But really, the, the, the fun part is that when you start mixing it and melding with the other AWS and, um, technologies. So for a lot of, again, depending on the size of your company and the security policies that you have, you can't just have people logging in and having that information on the clear web. So you start taking advantage of some of their, uh, some of their services. Let's say you have your AD infrastructure, which controls your, uh, your users and your, um, your, your, uh, your IM services. You can manage this through your own private VPC, which is basically a private network on AWS Cloud. You can connect everything through public endpoints. And uh, you can knot this down to your own, your own network. So you can have a, a connection between your private on-prem systems and AWS managed systems. Another, in a, another uh, big innovation in the field, which has, again, in the last two years, I'm seeing a lot more and more of it, is the network virtualization side. So with the traditional infrastructure as a service with VMware, where we have people just coming in and virtualizing just their servers, we're at the point now where we can virtualize routers, firewalls. We can set up load balancers. I mean, everything we're doing in AWS uh, over here in terms of this VPC. It's a form of network virtualization. But the big proponents of this technology are actually telecom companies because they're all trying to figure out how they can get more gigabytes into our phones. If you consider the, the challenges that they have, uh, you can understand why this is continuously evolving. The ability to provision rapidly uh, segmented networks is a very, is a very strong uh, feature. So, uh, I mean, for that said, we can, de we can decouple VLANs, firewalls, uh, load balancers, we can forward packets. We basically, it's at the point now that where that rack I just described, the only thing you have to go out and buy now are servers if you want to set up your own cloud. Buy some servers, buy a couple switches. Those switches will connect to your modem, and then from there you can have a virtual uh, router take care of everything else. Virtual firewalls will take care of everything else for you. And the, one of the most popular products, yeah, is uh, VM um, VMware's NSX. NSX is supposed to be their new ESX. Um, and the reason why it's very, it's gaining a lot of um, ground, it's gaining a lot of market share is because it's, it works natively with people's existing VMware infrastructure. I don't know if you guys have heard, VMware is actually coming to AWS now as well. You can now actually have VMware instances running on AWS. And you have no idea how big of a deal is that for like major industries where they have no intention of ever using AWS because they just invested a ton of money in training their infrastructure team just to use VMware. But now they can leverage their existing VMware services on AWS and NSX can be there in the, in the background controlling things like their security policies, where traffic should be flowing, um, ensuring that there's enough. You can say you can, you can rate limit certain VMs. There's quite a bit of, there's quite a bit of uh, capability in this area. Again, I'd, I could spend literally just hours talking about just network virtualization and as many applications. But um, yeah, no, this is, this, is also, this is also very, very big. Um, again, we started virtualizing servers eight years ago. That really took off. People started to trust it. And this, right now, people, a lot of people are still hesitant to go this route because they say, you know what, I really like my firewall. It works. I could look at it. It blinks. I could log into it. I don't know if I want to just start virtualizing that too, but once, once you kind of start... Uh, showing them what's, what they're capable of doing, how they can have a completely separated, isolated development environment without having to go and actually buy more hardware, that's very powerful, right? I mean, yeah, it could go on forever. Uh, to me, the cloud is a very fascinating topic, and um, it's going to continue to evolve. And we're going to see all that, again, that scale of evolution is continuously shrinking. I mean, even a, a good example is this is just, just our phones themselves. I mean, look at, look at a phone built today from like six years ago. It's, it's 10 times better, but does that make sense? Should it be six times better? No. The scale of evolution is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. We're seeing applications coming out. We're seeing so many services coming out that developers are like scratching their head going, a lot of developers who go to AWS don't even bother with half of those services I showed you. They just go ahead and they spawn an EC2 instance and they start installing their MySQL database on it or their, uh, their Apache web server. 
because that's the way they've thought for years. But, I mean, you guys are in school. I want you to start thinking cloud natively. Instead of spawning, you don't even need EC2. You don't even need a virtual machine. You can consume uh, services like AWS Lambda, where it's serverless. You just, give them your pro you just give them your code, your Python code, any code you want, and they will take care of it. Amazon will just run it for you. They will distribute it across their own, their own cluster. Again, this allows you to focus on providing that value. Instead of that, I'm going to focus on being an IT guy, you can focus on being a, an entrepreneur, an inventor, a creator, an artist. So that's it. That's it for me. I tried to keep it short. I hope I didn't go over because Peter, where Peter's going to give a presentation afterwards. Um, you're welcome. I think this is going to be available online. And you're always welcome to reach out to me. Um, I love answering questions. I love talking about this. I'm sure you could tell. Uh, and yeah, I just want to thank you guys. Appreciate it. I think we'll have, you want to do QA now or? No, you should answer questions while they're fresh. Yeah, sure. If you guys have quite like I can take some questions if anybody has any. So, uh, cloud has many security challenges, like uh, cloud computing, so, so on. And then can you mention the most challenging ones in cloud computation? Like, because I'm a cryptographer and we work on the projects related to cloud services, okay? So we imagine some of them, but uh, maybe you can tell us, because uh, as I understand, the major problem for the cloud is uh, security, because uh, in the cloud you keep all everything encrypted because you don't trust uh, the cloud, right? Because it's out of the same cloud. So. You, you encrypt everything and then, but when you want to manipulate with your files, like is database encrypted, so on and so forth. So how, what kind of problems uh, you think are major problems here? I think, I think it's a good question. And what, I'll, what ends up happening is when a lot of people just move to the cloud, they actually don't even consider the fact that how their networking, is, how their networking works at all. You know, if the applications themselves are, like, I mean, hopefully, God willing, that they are communicating amongst each other using an encrypted kind of methodology, some sort of SSL put in there. Uh, but most of the time, they're not. I mean, unfortunately, that's, that's the case, especially when you're doing this rapid prototyping of an application. So what ends up happening is um, a lot of people don't understand that they can provision their own internal networks that are completely internal to the cloud. So the tools are there for you to make things secure. Again, the onus is on you to know how to use them because it's unlike what you would be doing in your own data center because you can't see or touch or feel anything. It's all conceptual. It's all presented through, through, their, um, through their, their dashboard. Now, the second part is uh, not so much related to the actual security, like the data integrity or having, making sure nobody's snooping on you, but rather the fact that now the cloud provider, you just gave all your application, you just gave your business over to a cloud provider. I mean, who, who is familiar with like Amazon Prime? You guys have heard of Amazon Prime? So I'm, I mean, I have Amazon Prime. I, I use it quite a bit back home. It's got you know, two-day shipping. That's why I bought it. One of the things I found is they have Prime Video and they have a Prime Music service. Now, Spotify, Netflix, Dropbox, they all use AWS. What did AWS go do? They literally went and copied their most successful customers' businesses, and now they are providing it. So Netflix is wondering, why did we come to you guys? Like, why did we just give you all of our application logic? Because you, even though they can't prove, like, how can they prove it? If, if you give me your files, if you give me all of your most private photos on my hard drive, and I say, I promise I will never look at it, but then next, next week you see me at some party wearing like the exact same shirt that you know, I saw a photo of, you'll be wondering, Did, is there any chance you look through my files? I'm like, oh, there might be. You know, I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's the other challenge, uh, which is very difficult. And that's, why, that's honestly why companies like Stratascale exist, because customers want to consume things cloud natively, but they don't trust Amazon, just period. Not just Amazon. It's just they don't trust having their data off-site of in a different data center. So that's where the hybrid cloud comes in, where you can keep everything on-premises, and but consume maybe the CPU and memory of the AWS. We'll just, take, we'll just take one more, and then we'll get to you. Yeah, so the best thing is to keep the, your files uh, encrypted in the uh, ABC, for example, right? Mm -hmm. ABCD. So uh, ABC can look in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah if, you if you encrypt your own files, that's not a problem. But the problem is then when you want to manipulate with your files, 
It's then open, there comes right. the problem because you want to do some computations, but if, compu if, if your file is encrypted, how do you do these computations? Well, there's yeah, an overhead, so right? Yeah. You'll, you'll understand this coming from a cryptography background. Like yeah, 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 the private course. key is if you want to do any kind of computation or use your encrypted files in the cloud, you have to provide that private key to encrypt it, right? So your options are you can pull your file into oh, a local yeah, on-premise yeah, machine and encrypt it there. But <laughs> like the theory is, no matter what, in the end, that private key is somewhere in memory on a server. Yeah, and that's course, the, So that's where there's that kind of gray area of the, uh, cloud security and encryption. For a lot of, for many purposes, nobody's concerned about security of their like website. Like it depends on what kind of data you're. It depends on what kind of data you're handling. If we're talking about like I just use tiny so URL. Data, they yeah. Care about it, so a lot of the data out there isn't. Data in this world. Yeah, there is. And also, I still know a lot of internet shops that, that use WordPress for their websites. Yeah. And, like, uh, <laughs> Stop really and they don't update it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Any other questions for Aries? No, you know what? How about because I think we are running short. Okay, sure. At the end, we can have like a bit more of a QA. If it's no, 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 of course, go ahead. Awesome. So I'm going to talk about ZFS. We, we talk about all this data. It has to live somewhere. It's stored somewhere in the end, no matter what. Unless we're talking about AWS 10 years ago, where you would restart your machine and lose everything. But <laughs> so a little bit about me. I've been doing freelance system administration for a long time. And I went to school for a Bachelor of Applied Information Science, majoring in Information Systems Security. It's quite a mouthful. Um, how many people are familiar with VMware? I know we've talked about it a lot. I worked for VMware for four years. They sent me to VMworld, and I, oh, it was. VMware is a company, you know, VMware also has a branch here in Armenia. Really? I didn't know that. No, I didn't. VMware is so large, there's so many different departments that I could only be familiar with so many of them. But um, I worked out of, actually Aries and I both worked out of Burlington, Ontario. Good, good, fantastic. And VMware, they have so many different things that they're growing in. There's so many different fields that they are attacking head on. So it's very exciting. And I was basically designing and fixing thousands of customer environments uh, and in September 2013, I started my own company called Secure Information Systems, where I'm working with dozens of environments now. So we're going to talk about file systems. And uh, have you guys taken any security courses yet in school? What we learned back home about security is uh, it's a triangle. You have confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But this is what uh, I'm teaching cryptography. Yeah, so you're dealing with confidentiality. Integrity, authenticity also as well. Yep. It covers all this stuff. Availability, not so much. But no, it's access control, of course, it's like, again, confidentiality, access control. Yep. Um, what most people don't really think about is the availability aspect of security. You know, making sure that your resources are there when you need them, um, that they are intact and available, and just ready to go. And that's where file systems are very important. I mean, you can't store anything without a file system. It basically translates your meaningful data, your, your photos, your passwords, your databases into ones and zeros so we can store it and get it later. They provide organization, you know, a hierarchy, um, a way to search, a way to link to things. They provide you with uh, access security, ownership, who's allowed to see it and who isn't, and consistency. Um, if I take a memory card out of my phone, I should expect that the same data will be the same on another phone. You'd hope so. That's where the file systems come in. So they're optimized for what media they're being stored on. So like tapes, very old technology still in use because of the cost per terabyte is very low. But there's a file system specifically for storing something on a tape. Um, optical, like CDs, there's a specific type of file system for that. Um, clustering and transactional file systems where you're sharing, um, you're distributing something. There's a very specific way to access that kind of data. And I'm going to focus more on random access. This is what 
we're more familiar with. You know, an SSD, a hard drive, a memory card. Um, it's random access. You can just pick a file and it's ready to go. Whereas on a tape, it's got to fast forward, find the spot, read it in, maybe go to a different spot on the tape, read that in. Not very random, it takes too long. So it seems like simple, like anyone can do it, right? Well, no, not really. It's, pretty complicated. If you get into any kind of coding with file systems, it's just, there's just a lot to consider, a lot to think about, and it's not fun to work with as a programmer, so I don't want to deal with that. I'm going to use ZFS, <laughs> where someone else has done all the thinking for me. And there's a lot on the line. Like, if you get it wrong, you're going to lose your data. That's not something you want. Um, you have a horror story. Recently, a customer just, there was a problem, and they lost all their data, and that's, that's catastrophic. That can shut a business down. So a lot on the line. There's a lot of limitations. I'll talk about some of those. Um, typically, you and I might not hit these limitations, but as things grow and as things scale in the cloud, limitations become a big factor, a big element. And a file system has to put up with a lot of problems. Like, my files are on a little SD card in my phone. But if there's any problem with that SD card, or maybe the connection to the SD card, or something wrong with the phone itself, how am I going to get my files? Um, with hard drives, there's firmware on the drive. I'll get into all the things that connect to that hard drive later. But it has to put up with a lot of problems. So let's talk about some file systems. Um, maybe before I go into it, do you guys know like, maybe what file system is on your laptop? Anyone? I mean, it depends if you're running Linux, Apple, Windows. Well, one of the first ones, and you've probably seen this before, is FAT16. It's kind of developed by Microsoft uh, in coordination with a lot of other companies. Here's some of the limitations. Your file name could only be eight characters, a dot, and then three characters, and always uppercase. Uh, two gigabytes for a max file. That's not bad for 1984. Two gigabytes was the maximum size of your drive. And I mean, 1984, there was nothing two gigabytes in size. but it can only store 65,000 files. And then you're done. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't really scale very well. So come Windows 95 in 1996, we got FAT32. This one is insanely popular. Like most memory cards come FAT32 these days. Your maximum size is two terabytes. OK, that's better. And like a lot of these limits are a lot more reasonable now, so you won't really hit uh, big problems. NTFS, we've seen since Windows XP and old Windows NT machines. If you're running a Windows machine, Windows 10, Windows 7, you're running NTFS. And I mean, that's, that's a big number. 16 million terabytes. I don't think we have any single drive that can do that yet. But you know, at least it's ready for the future. Now, on the other side of things, we've got UFS. This is kind of what turned into like Apple and Solaris and FreeBSD and it. <laughs> People back home would understand this. FFS, it's an acronym for, for fuck's sakes. <laughs> so they changed the name for some reason. Um, but that's, again, a very big file. 8 million terabytes uh, in 1977. <laughs> cool, you're ready for the future. Let's hang on to this one. And these goals, like everything that UFS was designed to be is still alive today. Like I said, uh, Apple is still using UFS in, in the Mac OS. Uh, Solaris machines and BSD machines are still using it. Probably not something you see every day because it's more of a server, it's in the cloud thing that you don't have to think about. Now this one's kind of interesting. Minix FS was designed as like a, a learning file system. So the programming is very simple and it's, it was kind of a school project that actually caught on and people were very interested in because it helps you learn the computer science behind it. Very simple, very easy to use. But here's our limitations. 64 megabytes and 14 character file names. Doesn't work so well for modern, modern day things. But this kind of turned into EXT. Anyone use Linux? Yeah, so you know EXT and Linux go hand in hand. And it's been that way for a very long time. The first EXT, it's called Extensible. So EXT1 came out in 92. Eh, it's not bad. That's, that's fairly reasonable. VFS is the whole concept of how everything is a file. Like you would mount another file system as a file. Like, so that was the first time we kind of really saw this uh, in the wild. Very cool feature, but not something, you know, if you're designing a file system, you wouldn't think, oh, I'm going to put VFS in this. 
It does have problems. That's why we don't see ext1, like fragmentation, where like files are broken up into a lot of different scattered across the physical disk, makes things slower. Like deleting files, clearing up inodes was a problem. So your disk could kind of fill up, and you wouldn't know why. But ext2 came along very shortly after. So we went from 1992, one year later, ext2. <laughs> CXT was good, but we need to fix some of these problems. So this one, very extensible, very flexible. Um, this is the first time we've seen 32-bit timestamps, which means this is, you can say a date modified is somewhere between here and here. And this will be a problem in, what, 20 years? We'll see what happens there. But we can fit a lot of files on this one. This is much better. And your maximums just depend on how it's formatted, but it, these are all very reasonable, reasonable numbers that are future-proof in a way. Anyone heard of this one? Riser, they call it. I say Reser. <laughs> um, and this started in about 2001. It was developed by a guy in California. Um, and it was just trying to fix all the problems with ext2. And we're seeing things like uh, journaling. So like, I'll actually get into what that means later. Um, you can, if you have a, like a disk, like kind of a virtual disk in the cloud, and you add more space to it, like a, an iSCSI LUN, for example, you can click a button and take up that space. And that's kind of a future thing that is very important in the cloud these days. And we're seeing that now in 2001. Um, small block, it's fast, like very small files. It can deal with that easily versus other file systems couldn't. Um, a B tree scan, you'll learn about that in your computer science courses, but it's a way of searching and it's much faster than classic file systems where it literally had to go down an entire list to find what you were looking for. And it had a lot of consistency check issues, weird behavior it would do, but you know, it was in development. But um, this guy got accused of murder for killing his wife and it kind of stopped development of this. So the lesson of the day is just don't kill your wife because <laughs> this could have gone somewhere. <laughs> XT3, this is, probably the most popular with Linux these days. Journaling, again, we'll get into that. It's backwards compatible to ext2, which, is, which means you can take an ext2 and upgrade it to ext3 like that. Done, cool. Um, now performance, it's a little bit slower than ext2, but uh, ACID, has anyone come across this yet? It's another computer science concept. Atomicity, uh, consistency, integrity, and I don't remember. It's been a while. What's that? Oh, durability, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, and this is just the concept of like, think of a database. Like if you have three or four web servers talking to the same database and they wanna update something at the same time, if your database isn't ACID compliant, weird things are gonna happen with that data. But if it is ACID compliant, it's gonna ensure, oh, hold on, you can't touch this because this server is working with that right now. So it's just a way of extra consistency um, end to end across the board. But like before, we still have fragmentation problems, which affects performance. Um, interestingly, I don't think many people know this, but it can only have 32,000 directories. Kind of weird. And it's still based on that old EXT classic design. It's just that, and they just keep adding to it and keep adding to it and keep extending it. But it still fundamentally has those same drawbacks um, in the code that the original version did. So this is where we're talking about journaling, yeah. Uh, is Apple working on uh, updating the UFC, uh, making better? Uh, UFS? Yeah. Yeah, UFS is still, like, Apple's still using it. Um, BSD and Solaris. Well, Solaris is another story, but um, U UFS is very simple and very straightforward, and there's new versions of it. Like, Apple's using it primarily these days, I think. It's I hope called that. HFS Plus now. I have a California system. Awesome. And it's all based on UFS, like it's, it came from that. If you, you can look up the Wikipedia article and learn a lot about it, it's, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not. But there is no source code of that uh, new, uh, new, new... No, I, so HFS is specific to Apple. I yeah. think it's closed source, but it's based on, based on UFS, yeah. Um, did anyone use Windows like 15 years ago? Ever seen any of these? This is old scan disk on like a FAT32, or let's say you plug a memory card into your computer and it says, oh, we need to scan it, something's wrong. Um, that has to do with journaling. It's a consistency thing. So if, if you pull the power out of your machine and it was in the middle of something, 
it knows that it wasn't shut down clean. So it's doing a consistency check because it doesn't really know where things left off. When you have a journal, no. A journal is a way of, it, we tell the application we're not done yet until it's written to the journal. And then we kind of know we can replay what actions it was trying to do on the file system. And we have that with NTFS now. So Windows, you'll never see this on Windows these days because it doesn't need to, it has a journal. So ext4, this is the latest for Linux. And like, just, just to give you an idea, like this is a good feature list. It's much better. This is a lot more future proof. It's interesting because you can take something that's ext3 and mount it as ext4 and take advantage of all of this. But then you could take that same file system and mount it as ext3 again. And that's it, it still works. Kind of interesting. Performance is better. Um, the journal has checksumming now, which helps with the consistency a lot better. We have nanosecond resolution with timestamps. <laughs> we can figure out when something was modified down to the nanosecond now. Might be useful in the future. Um, and the dates go up to 2514. So we're future proof for a little while, but it's still EXT. It's still the old design. It still has fragmentation problems. Performance could still be better. Like there's just a lot of problems with it that we can't, it's fundamentally coded in there. So we were expecting a lot from a file system. We want it to survive power outages, system crashes. You know, when Windows has a blue screen, you don't want to find out that you've just lost all your data just because of some stupid problem or some bad driver. Terrible. Geometry changes are very important these days, like with cloud technology where you're expanding the size of a disk or maybe you're shrinking it. We need to be able to do that on the fly without downtime. We're expecting a lot here. Consistency checks. We don't want to have to reboot to do a consistency, consistency check. We don't want to have to shut things down. Like it's all about the availability. We want to make sure it's ACID compliant. We want it to be fast, fast, fast. Can't ever be slow. It has to be efficient. Uh, we want to make use of our storage abilities as best we can. And we still want it to be cheap because <laughs> we're asking for a lot here and that usually comes at a cost. So what can we do? Let's talk about some cost things here and some complexity. At first, at the, the very bottom layer is your actual storage, your hard drive, your SSD, your memory card. There's firmware involved on this device. That talks to an interface. Um, you're probably familiar with SATA or like the old IDE standard. Um, SAS is very popular in servers. SCSI is older. It's integrated in SAS now, but we're still talking to a controller somewhere else. And it's another layer where something can go wrong. And these controllers usually have their own firmware too. And there's the controller, uh, RAID. Anybody know what RAID is? It's like where you have two hard drives and they're mirrored so one can crash and the other stays going. Um, you can have like five hard drives that the data is split across all of them with, with consistency and uh, checksums to be able to rebuild your data in case a drive fails. This is a lot of software, a lot of firmware, and a lot of things can go wrong here too. And then your actual kind of structures, your file system itself. Um, with Linux, you'd be, you might be familiar with LVM, GPT, um, MBR. This is like the boot code and how the disk is partitioned up. And it's just the kind of logical structures. And again, a lot of software involved here and a lot of things that can go wrong. So these days, this is kind of what we're seeing in these layers. SSDs, they're expensive. We're seeing storage arrays with hundreds of these just for speed. And it's not cheap. SAS backplane is kind of as good as it can get these days. Multiple RAID controllers, like you'll have two or three controllers in a server all talking to the same hard drives. Just because if one of these fails, we still want to make sure our data is still there. And proprietary operating systems, closed source file systems, closed source software this, open this, close this. Everybody has their own way of tackling this problem. Here's another one. This one, 2009, it's supposed to be the savior of file systems. It's been developed by IBM and Oracle, but it's still unstable to this day. We're almost 10 years in. They've been developing it like crazy, but it's just not trustworthy yet. But it has everything that we kind of want. I mean, look at these features. There isn't even a journal anymore. They got around that. We can defrag it on the go. We can grow it, shrink it. We can rate it. We can add, remove devices. We can check it for consistency, compress everything. There's snapshot. It's crazy. It can do everything, but it's unstable. So no one wants to use it. So 
Now we have ZFS. And this has been developed for some time with Solaris. And it fixes problems that you might have never thought of. Bit rot. Consider your hard drive. It's magnetic. There's ones and zeros. But if one of those bits flips, which is really easy to do, I mean, anywhere along that layer, something can go wrong. One bit flips, suddenly your data is inconsistent. ZFS has ways of dealing with that and detecting it and correcting it. Um, block sizes, this is a performance thing where like a small file can take up a small amount of space physically on the drive and a large one can take up just what it needs. It gives us good performance. CPU, never gets used, sits there idle a lot, especially in a storage server. ZFS will make great use of your CPU. It'll compress your data, which has no impact to performance and latency before saving it on the drive. We're using the CPU and we're saving space. Pretty cool. Makes very good use of memory as well, like caching your memory, uh, sorry, caching data in memory. Management is, it's kind of simplified. It's, that depends on which vendor you're talking to. And if you're familiar with RAID, there's this concept of a RAID 5 write hole, which uh, it can cause disastrous effects. If, if the timing is just wrong when your computer crashes, if it's writing that last bit of information in a RAID 5 and it crashes, you won't even know that there was a problem until maybe the RAID gets rebuilt. And then it's reading data that was inconsistently written, but we have no idea that that happened. It gets rebuilt wrong. Whatever data was there is now useless. Which one? Bitrot is about uh, controlling yeah. everything. But file systems always uh, are controlled somehow. Not necessarily. ZFS, when you store a file, it will also store a checksum. Yeah, but a CRC code isn't going to help you rebuild. It, you can't rebuild the broken bit with a CRC. CRC is just for detecting. But right. Can this can correct. Okay. ZFS so keeps. Code code is correcting one error if happens. Yeah. Yeah, like an XOR hash. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's. I mean, it, it always existed. I didn't understand. It's, it's just come now. I don't. I don't think NTFS keeps a checksum of the blocks. And this is block level, by the way. It's not file level. I don't think NTFS or FAT keep any kind of record of what it's supposed to be. Now, in a RAID, a RAID will try to, but that's back to the RAID five write hole. Anytime you're doing um, RAID five or RAID six across devices. Uh, RAID 1 won't suffer from this because it's uh, two drives that are supposed to be exactly the same, but it won't be able to detect which one is correct. It'll have no idea. It'll just know that they're inconsistent. And you could get data loss. We don't want that. Uh, by default, SHA-1 to detect problems. SHA-1? Yeah. Is no, SHA one's a hashing algorithm. Hash, hash, no yeah, yeah. Uh, sh uh, okay. And you can select if you want SHA two, uh, SHA two fifty six, SHA five twelve. It just depends on how crazy you want, and that all just lands on the CPU. I mean, it comes at no cost because CPUs are faster than storage. Oh, it's controls via SHA. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it's really nice. And then when it detects that, then it'll go down to like the RAID layer that's built into ZFS to determine how to correct it. The file system and the device management is all integrated together. So it can, it has the ability to talk to the RAID and say, okay, this isn't right. Like we detected a problem with a file. Now let's figure out how to correct it. Whereas NTFS, even if NTFS is on RAID, all Windows can do is say something's wrong. The CRC doesn't match. It has no way to go down to the RAID level and try to correct it. And a CRC, like CRC is not very thorough. I mean, two bits, it might not even be able to detect it if it was the right two bits that flipped. Whereas a SHA is going to be extremely unproblematic. Like uh, the probability of having a, a hash collision is insanely, insanely low. So some things about ZFS. Sun Microsystems started it in about 2005. That is a big number. <laughs> That's the maximum size of one volume. That's, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get there someday, but uh, I don't think we're there yet. Um, this is estimated how many terabytes of data there are like in every server, every laptop, every computer in the entire world today. 
well, maybe like a year ago. But you know, that's we still got a ways to go. Um, your maximum file size is also quite massive. Um, and this is how many devices you can have in a pool and how many pools you can have in one system. Uh, Aries talked about vertical scaling versus horizontal. This is some insane vertical scaling. <laughs> but in a storage server, you can't always scale horizontally. Um, you're forced to scale vertically and that gives us a lot of options. I think the zeros keep going. <laughs> Not sure, but uh, either way, that's gonna work for a while. And it's open source, uh, depending on who you talk to. There was a whole rift within Sun Microsystems. Oracle bought Sun and then closed off Open Solaris. And yeah, it's a whole thing, but um, it's still an active development. As of the time that that happened, they lost a lot of developers that just forked it, started their own. And it's still very much alive today. So we just had a great discussion about the data integrity that's built into this. It's great. Um, inline deduplication, where let's say you save the same file twice, it can detect that on the fly and only save it physically on the drive once. Uh, native inline compression that we talked about a little bit, where let's compress the data before we store it on the disk. Why not? CPU is cheap. Copy on write is a type of journaling. When we want to write a, a file or a change to a file, instead of actually modifying the original file, we just copy it to a new place and write the changes there. And then it can figure it out later. And that's great because if this crashes while it's doing that right, you still have the old file there unmodified. The vari variable block size we talked about just for efficiency purposes. Um, we can, I talked about how it uses RAM a lot. Um, the deduplication table, if you learn about that, it's, it takes a lot of RAM, but we can cache it all in memory. It's smart about that, so it helps with performance. And there's a kind of a write cache. Like, it's kind of like a journal, except it's still kind of following this copy on write policy where you write a new block. Let's say your disks are very slow because we want cheap, but you can put one very expensive, very small SSD that's nice and fast into the uh, server. It'll write the changes there first and it won't confirm back to the application. It's not gonna say, okay, it's done, it's safe until we know it's on stable storage, which could be a very, very fast SSD and we've just saved a lot of money. And that's important because if your application thinks, okay, it's safe, time to move on to the next thing, but then something happens, now your application's inconsistent, maybe there's some data loss, results may vary, but it's not something we wanna have to worry about. So uh, yeah, we talked about the checksums again. Um, the SHA-256, I think that's the default. You can do SHA-512 now. Uh, instead of RAID, uh, RAID 5, RAID 6, they call it RAID Z. We're from Canada, so we say Z. Uh, and we can do mirroring, we can do the striping, which is the equivalent of RAID 5. Um, RAID 5 is where there's one disk of parity. RAID 6 is where there's two disks of parity. ZFS can do three disks of parity, which I just like to call RAID 7. RAID 7 is not actually a thing. Um, ZFS calls it RAID Z3 for three disks of parity. That's a lot of redundancy and a lot of safety in case one of your hard drives fails. And hard drives do fail, especially if we're talking the old style HDDs that have spinning parts and moving parts and they fail like crazy. It's very easy to like, I can take a directory on ZFS and say, I wanna keep three copies of this directory. And at the lower label, layers, sorry, it's automatically keeping that data in three different places on the disks. And it's just for extra safety if you're really, really concerned about the integrity of your data. Resilvering is like kind of rebuilding your RAID. It can do it very, very smart and very quickly. Um, classic RAID, it has to go through the entire hard disk from start to finish because it's, it's rebuilding a lost drive. But ZFS, because it has visibility into the file system, it knows where the data is. It knows it doesn't have to rebuild like all of these areas of the disk because they were never even used at all in the first place. So this goes very quickly. And scrubbing is a way that it goes through the disk and it verifies those checksums of every file to make sure everything's consistent. They say for a, a SATA disk, which is your typical off the shelf kind of hard drive, that you should do that every week because they're more susceptible to problems. Um, and this is just a great way to know that yeah, you know, those, those family photos from seven years ago that I haven't even looked at, they're still consistent. Because there's nothing worse than like, you go into that album from seven years ago and some of the pictures are corrupt. You had no idea. 
your backups are, maybe they go back a couple of weeks, but the corruption happened years ago. You'd have no idea, but because of this scrubbing process, we can prevent that bit rod and just have that extra. We can sleep better at night knowing that even all that old data that we haven't looked at in a long time is still going to be there. And we can do shit, uh, stuff like <laughs> snapshots, cloning. We can take the entire drive and say, just take a snapshot. I just want to keep that in the back in case I need to get some old files later. Um, we can literally clone the entire system over to another array. It's built in. If you have two of the same server, we can say, yeah, just copy it over to this one. Go, done. And it's quick because it knows where the files are. And the performance is awesome. Like, CPU is never used in file system, uh, in, uh, storage servers, essentially. So we're going to make use of it with ZFS. Deduplication, a lot of people are demanding that these days. It's just very efficient, and ZFS does it quickly. Um, the ARC is the adaptive replacement cache. It's just a way of keeping track what files were accessed most and what, ac what files were accessed um, the most recently. And it's kind of a combination of those two queuing styles. Um, an L2 arc is a way that we can store anything. We can store more of that on a disk because, you know, memory, maybe you don't have enough of it, but we can put another SSD in this machine and say, well, just use this for more adaptive replacement cache. And it just makes the reads go super, super fast, especially for things that are accessed all the time. Just because of the style of queue it is, it knows, oh, this data's right here. Here you go. And it can worry about um, writing things to the disk later. As soon as we know it's on that SSD, which is, it's essentially a write cache, but we know it's there and it's safe. And if the disks for your array are busy, they're doing something else more important, we're going to write the data to it later because we already know we have it and it's safe. Whereas like a classic file server, it might keep it in memory, but memory is volatile. So if you pull the power on that server, everything in memory is gone, including your data that wasn't safely written to the disk yet. Um, and variable stripe size has to do with RAID. Again, it's kind of like the block size. Um, in old style RAIDs, your block, sorry, your stripe size is fixed when you build the array. That might not be efficient for the types of files or the different demands of the files that are going to be stored on the server. So with a variable stripe, we can just easily kind of keep things more consistent and more uh, efficient down on the base disk. An administration of a ZFS file system, I do a lot of things from command line, but it's very kind of straightforward. Um, VDEVs are your disks, essentially. Um, the ZFS pool itself is your construct. You know, we've taken these four disks and this SSD and we've handed it over to ZFS. There's your pool. And then the data sets are kind of your virtual kind of file systems you can build on top of that. And all your data sets is where you get to explore these options. Maybe you don't want to deduplicate all your data. You don't have a lot of RAM on the server or, or whatever. You could have different compression options. Like we can do quick compression or we can do very heavy compression um, at the expense of more CPU power. Lots of flexibility, lots of options. It kind of looks like this. Like this would be, this machine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight drives rated together. Um, there's a SSD mirror. It's two drives mirrored together for writes because they're very worried about consistency. And two drives that are just for caching, for reads. Some of the things like, these are the different um, data sets, and these would have different options on them. Like maybe this one's deduplicated, and this one is not compressed, and this one has snapshots taken every week. There are some drawbacks of ZFS today, especially because of everything that happened with Oracle and the forking of ZFS code base, but you can't reshape this. Like once you've set it up in this kind of format, this can't be changed. Whereas like a, a Linux LVM style um, RAID, you can work with it and change it, maybe add another disk to the RAID. Um, we can't shrink this. I mean, it only grows. And it's with cloud stuff, sometimes you want to be able to shrink things. There are extra performance considerations. Like if we're turning on deduplication, you need to consider how much memory that's going to take up for how much data you want to store. Or think about like, well, does my data deduplicate well or not? Like how much duplication is actually happening in my data? Maybe it's not enough for you to want to turn it on. And like the design considerations, just because we can't really change it later, we can add to it. We can grow it. I can take this and add another four drives into another RAID and just add it in and have all that extra space. And it'll, it'll take it. It'll work with it. So you do have some flexibility, but it's always good to get it right from the start. 
this is the thing about what happened with it and Oracle and <laughs> Sun Microsystems. They started Java. They supported open source. I mean, like, I'm sure you guys have programmed with Java or encountered it at some point. And when Oracle came in and bought Sun, they murdered all this kind of open source love that, that Sun had. And um, they went and they closed source Solaris. Open Solaris just got killed. And that causes some problems with licensing. Um, so what happened is all the developers, well, not all of them, but a very significant number of very significant developers just said, I quit. I'm done. I'm out. Um, new companies were started. And they started Illumos, which is kind of the Linux of Solaris. It's pretty cool, but it's kind of, it's a fork. It goes down its own path. But it's all the guys that basically designed and created ZFS. Now they're working on it open source. And uh, under licensing, they're allowed to take that source code from 2010 when this was still open source and continue developing it. And so Illumos is an open source kind of Solaris that has a lot of active development. And, uh, and it's true because Oracle has now actually shut down their Solaris project. It's done, it's over, not supported anymore. Um, I guess they just lost all the developers. I mean, they're not very smart about, uh, you know, managing their people and making good decisions. And the best part is all the work that they're putting into ZFS today, Oracle can't touch it because they would have to open source all of Solaris to even touch that code under license. But it doesn't matter now because they killed Solaris. Good job, guys. So if you want to play with ZFS, um, ZFS on Linux is now considered stable. Ubuntu is considering making ZFS um, the primary file system in their next release. Illumos is kind of the Solaris, the open source Solaris. Um, and there's, just like Linux, there's lots and lots of distributions and flavors and depends on what you like. Um, fuse drivers, this isn't even necessary these days because ZFS on Linux is stable. Like this is a kernel module and this is like a user space driver that just doesn't have the same abilities. And uh, there's a Mac ZFS as well. I don't know much about it. I'm not a Mac person. I think that's it. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, yeah, one of the questions is, uh, can I choose uh, the file system in my uh, cloud, for example? Well, the best thing about the cloud is you don't have to worry about it. Uh, so, but what, what, uh, what do they use for uh, cloud? Oh, it's hard to know for sure. Like block, block storage, right, versus object storage. So the block storage, like EBS, you would. Mm. But object storage, you, it's just, uh, it, it's, um, it's file level. So you don't worry about the file system at all. It depends on which layer of the cloud you're getting into, whether we're talking infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, application as a service, pizza as a service. It just depends because this, the file system is such a lower layer that if you're, if you're subscribing to like a, an application as a service, you're just kind of giving them your source code. You don't have to deal with it. They've already, they're dealing with this in the background. But if you're doing like infrastructure as a service, this is very much infrastructure. So you would have more selection and, and more to think about and more to deal with with how you want your files kept, uh, or if you're building your own file server even. But the, yeah, the best thing about the cloud is that usually you don't have to think about or worry about those kinds of things. But the thing is that uh, different file systems uh, eat uh, different computational power, right? Kind of. Yeah, like performance-wise, there's benchmarks of like, okay, let's copy this, this big file from one to another. And they do it on each file system and they see which one's fastest. Yeah. Um, Performance-wise, ZFS is pretty good. Um, EXT is a little bit slower in some regards. It's a little bit faster in some. Like it's, there's always benefits and drawbacks to, to every file system. And for me and my customers and the work that I do, the integrity of the data is way more important than the performance. Yeah. And it's a bonus that this performs very well for what it does. Um, it has its own, because it's copy on write, there is a lot of fragmentation, but because of the read cache, you always have like uh, kind of copies of files that are accessed the most often ready to go, maybe on an SSD or in memory. Because it's a read cache, we don't care what happens to it. You know, it could crash and burn and that's fine because everything is still safe on the base disks. Um, so that's why you can just throw a cheap SSD in or just throw a lot of RAM in and your reads will be very, very quick. But the writes will get very fragmented, but you don't even have to think about it.
Yeah. So you said about the benchmark. So say I'm working with big files like videos. I'm always editing them. How much uh, CPU and RAM can I expect to can consume with ZFS if I'm working like say uh, alpha terabyte file? What I would do in that case is don't deduplicate it because it's a video file and chances are there's not a duplicate of it somewhere on your file server. Um, like, because if it tries to go through a terabyte file and look for duplication, it's going to take a while. It's going to have a lot of overhead. So you would store that somewhere on a data set without deduplication on. Um, you may even consider turning compression off because it's a, a movie file. It's probably got its own compression depending on what format you're working with. So in that case, we're just kind of talking straight down to the disk and it's just the same performance you would get from, uh, from the disks on a different file system. So the main use of CPU and RAM are for deduplication and caching? Um, the CPU will be a lot of uh, compression. Like compressing a file is CPU heavy. And um, uh, like consistency checks, like computing the SHA-256 value of that file so it can store it. But the disks are always slower than the CPU by like thousands of times. You know, the CPU latency is very, very quick, whereas even an SSD might have a one millisecond latency, but the CPU, we're talking microseconds. So the CPU can do a million things in the time that it takes the disk to do one thing.